I'm Anna Esperham. I am an MD. So I'm triple board certified right now in pediatrics, integrative medicine, and medical acupuncture with a lot of specialty training in headache and pain medicine. Uh, and I've been practicing academic, academic medicine for the past 12 years. So we do both clinical, we do a lot of research. So I've been published, I have multiple manuscripts. Um, we build a lot of medical curricula. Uh, we also serve, so I've served on many national medical organizations. I served as medical director, chair. Um, and now, as I just mentioned before, I'm gonna go back to residency to become quadruple board certified in osteopathic neuromusculoskeletal medicine. Um, oh, I just see, yeah, Avery wants to go into pain management, wound care. Pain management's awesome. Wound care is so cool. Um, I do love the procedural care and I do find, that's why I went, I'm going back to residency. I actually start Monday um, to do osteopathic neuromusculoskeletal medicine. I know most DOs actually were the ones doing osteopathic neuromusculoskeletal medicine, but there has been some changes with the ACGME requirements that MDs and DOs can now do the same residencies. And so um, I'm going to go learn what they do. Um, I've been an MD advisor and pre-med mentor for advanced e-clinical training for the past year, but I've mentored so many students um, throughout the years as I'm highly involved in education as an academic medicine doctor. And um, I have also participated in the medical school admissions processes and interviewed many students. Um, so that was exciting. And if you don't already know about advanced e-clinical training. It's basically an um, online self-paced allied health certification program. It's designed for you guys. So pre-health, undergraduate and post-bachelorette students. So really with our mission to provide engaging, accessible and affordable clinical certification programs. And it is more affordable than other programs that I've seen out there to prepare you guys to get into medical school, PA school, pharmacy, dental um, and nursing school. And those programs, we have several certification programs. So we've got certified medical assistant, certified patient care technician, certified pharmacy tech, advanced medical terminology certificate, the clinical research assistant, and then also the physical therapy technician. And um, usually a lot of these programs can be done within eight weeks. And it's really important that they have these certification programs because a lot of the schools, so nursing, PA school, medical school, are going to be looking at these types of certifications, especially if you can work as like a medical assistant, a physical therapy tech, clinical research assist assistant, et cetera. But we also have another side to advance clinical training, which is the mentorship programs. And that's where I come in. And those are for students really, really interested in going to what you guys are going into medical school, physician assistant school, dental school, and pharmacy school. So, and then since you guys are doing this webinar today, we have a special discount for you guys um, to get $300 off any of the certification or mentorship programs. Just use that coupon code. Actually, I'll put it in the chat and then I'll kind of say it at the end as well, but it's webinar 300. Yes, is the coupon code. Um, and then what, and yeah, you can go to advclinical.org is the website to learn more about the certification and the mentorship programs. Um, and um, Shabnam has just put that in the um, chat box as well. Um, oh, wait, no, she sent it to me. Hold on, let me get it for you. Okay. Okay, there. So there's the website, just plugged it in. So coupon code for today's webinar is Webinar 300 to get $300 off any of the certification and mentorship programs, and then go to the website to learn more about a lot of these programs that I just discussed today, both the certification and the mentorship programs. Okay, so just a few housekeeping. Um, let's keep this as interactive as possible. I'll try and answer questions as we go, um, and I'll also try and keep looking at the chat box as well. Um, so let me put these over here. And then I will also have some polls throughout just to make the questions interactive. This is not to test you guys by any means. It's just to kind of keep it more fun, uh, more interactive, more engaged. This is all for you to learn about how um, a case is presented, how you guys would start thinking as a student, whether you're a PA student, medical student, or in nursing school. So um, I think you guys will like it. Okay, so let's go on to the case. Um, let's 
move here. Let me pull it up. All right, so. All right, guys, here's the case. Acute onset left shoulder pain. This goes by pretty kick, pretty quick. It's only a minute long, so pay attention. Hey, good afternoon. Good evening. I'm Dr. Moore. We're here at Yale New Haven Hospital. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm sorry this happened. Can you just tell me what happened? Yep. So my police organization works at the Coast Guard a lot. We're out with the Coast Guard doing some compliance checks. And it, we were boarding a vessel, did a safety check by the, when it was time to get back onto the Coast Guard boat. I had one arm on the Coast Guard boat and one arm on the other person's boat. A big wave came and separated the two vessels, and I kind of sh and it kind of took my left arm with it. And next thing I knew, I heard three pops, and I couldn't lift up my left arm. Okay, and your left arm here—that's that's where it's hurting. We'll compare yep. this. The right arm is fine, right? You can move that yes, around. Yes, this arm's fine. Yep. Yeah, okay. And this one here, see, there's a little corner that's pretty tender there. Yes. The clavicle's okay. The arm down here is okay? Yes. And the elbow? Okay. Yep. The pain kind of trickles down the arm. And you really like can't that move that. Can't really move it, no. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to get an x ray and do an ultrasound like we talked about and be back with you, okay? Thank you. Okay, so for our first poll, I just want to go over this because as um, a student in the healthcare field, you guys are either going to have to quickly act quickly or you can take your time. And so um, let's go over the appearance. So when you first looked at her, did you find that she was very toxic was she in severe distress or she was just chilling she was cool she wasn't in that much pain not sick not toxic very minimal distress and this is going to be your first poll so let me pull it up here okay you can go ahead and put your answers in and i'll just wait one minute Okay, so pretty much wrapping up, it looks like most of you are deciding non-toxic and minimal distress. Okay, so good. Um, okay, I think that's about the max. All right, so here you go. Um, everyone, great job. Um, you know, this is really subjective for the most part, but it, it just kind of helps you when you first take a look at a patient just from the door, do you need to act fast or can you take your time? And so this is really for someone in severe distress versus minimal distress. And so if you look at this patient's vitals, so she doesn't have a high temperature. She's not running a fever. Her heart rate 62. So it doesn't seem like most people who are in pain, they their heart rate raises way up. And so usually it'll be, for most people who are not athletic or not in shape or not physically fit, their heart rate will be quite a bit higher. So usually around 90 to sometimes 110, 120. Um, it might be because she's an athlete that her heart rate 62 and that she's just chilling. So, um, so that looks good. Respiratory rate is fine. She's not breathing super fast. Pulse ox is fine. So she, her oxygen saturation is good. Her blood pressure is perfect. And blood pressure also goes up when they are in quite a bit of pain as well. So blood pressure and heart rate definitely raise through the roof when um, people are in pain. She doesn't really have a lot of other red flags per her history. Um, and so I think we can clarify she's not toxic and not in severe distress. However, she still is in quite a bit of pain. She's not moving her, her arm. Her arm, if you look, I just want to show you. Okay, let's see. And it kind of took my left arm with it. And next thing I knew, I heard three pops and I couldn't lift up my left arm. Okay. 
and your left arm here, that's that's where it's hurting. We'll compare yep. this. The right arm is fine, right? You can move that yes, around. Yes, this arm's fine. Yep. Yeah, okay. And this one here, see there's a little corner that's pretty tender there. Yes. The clavicle's okay. The arm down here is okay? Yes. And the elbow? Okay. Yep. The pain kind of trickles down the arm. And you really can't that move that. Can't really move it, no. Okay. So her arm is in more of the, so abducted position. So add a deduct is where it adds to the body, a B duck. So a B duction, abduction is where it's stretched out. And then she also kind of has it a little bit externally rotated. So you can internally rotate your shoulder and you can externally rotate your shoulder. And so she kind of has it out like that, but she does not want to move it because it caused her pain and pain is trickling down her arm as well. So she is in pain. She's just probably got a strong pain threshold. So Fatima, great question. Um, she has a question about, um, the difference between toxic and non-toxic. And so those terms are very typical when you go into the healthcare profession and what you need to know about your patient when you walk into the door. Does this person look sick? Is this person have pallor? Are, do they have diaphoresis or sweating? Are they um, breathing hard? Um, do they look like gray, for example? So that means that they could have a severe infection. They could be bleeding internally. They are looking very sick on the near verge of death. And that's why when someone looks toxic, you got to go in as fast as you can. You might have to run a code. You got to call the team in and take Take care of that person right away. So great question. Okay, so next question is going to be the differential diagnosis. And so I'm going to have you guys do another poll. Let me start that. Okay. All right, what is your differential of diagnosis of this patient's condition, your best guess. Okay, so looks like um, the majority did say it is a shoulder dislocation. And so, um, yes, that is the correct answer, but it's very hard to tell because, you know, it, there can be definitely a shoulder muscle strain. There can be a rotator cuff injury. There can be a humerus or a clavicular fracture with the shoulder dislocation, and there can be a brachial plexus injury. So it was kind of a trick question, but the main diagnosis is uh, shoulder dislocation. And so, um, if you look, um, here, as we talked about some of those red flags, um, we do have concern for fracture with any shoulder dislocation or any type of trauma whatsoever, in addition to nerve damage and vessel damage. Now, the doctor in that emergency room, he did not show you his neurovascular exam, um, but that is definitely something that you would have to do before and after you do any type of treatment. Okay, so we went over the differential diagnosis. Um, the biggest brachial plexus injury that we're talking about, especially for a shoulder dislocation, is going to be the axillary nerve, and, and we'll show you why as well. So um, let's talk about workup. Um, okay, so, all right, what? Is your workup in diagnosing this patient's condition after you've done your physical exam and you suspect that shoulder dislocation? What would you do?
Okay, looks like about everyone's answered and I'll share the results with you guys. Um, so it looks like everyone, a lot of you chose the x-ray of the shoulder. So that is um, very typical, um, especially when you are not trained in the point of care ultrasound. So this um, patient you'll see was in the emergency room and most emergency room docs are now trained in point of care ultrasound. So ultrasound is usually only going to show you the actual separation of that humerus from that shoulder joint, the glenohumeral shoulder joint. And so that's why most people will get the ultrasound plus an x-ray. Um, this doc is going to explain, he is only going to do the ultrasound um, because he, I, he must have done a neurovascular and a very good neuro uh, physical and orthopedic physical exam beforehand and not showing you that during the case. Um, but both of those answers are correct. It's just usually you do want an x-ray to make sure there is no other fracture um, or other trauma that has occurred during this shoulder dislocation. Now, um, labs, you don't really need to get any labs unless there is some kind of injury to the axillary artery, which we'll discuss. So if the patient is bleeding, if the patient has, patient has more trauma, and then later on, this patient might get an MRI of the shoulder if she has persistent issues, if she, if she had potentially a rotator cuff tear, a labral tear, um, Let's see, what would you suggest if an ultrasound or MRI doesn't show much information because doesn't an MRI show muscle tissue? Yeah, so MRI would definitely get to more. It's just usually when you're in the acute setting, you don't go to um, the most expensive imaging that also can take um, usually up to now, especially at most academic medical centers, sometimes several days to a couple of weeks to get into MRI. So the quickest way to identify it is the ultrasound the shoulder and the x-ray. Um, okay, so great question, Isabella. Um, let me just look at the chat real quick. Okay, good. Okay, so here's our workup. Um, just a sec. Okay. Um, and then Avery asked, when would an MRI be more appropriate for this situation? Um, an MRI most typically, um, it would be very rare unless it, they would have to send this patient to orthopedic surgery. And that's when potentially a CT scan or an MRI, whatever they can get first would be recommended. Um, so that's usually if there is going to be neurovascular compromise, you want to get an MRI if it's available, if not, then CT. And then um, if um, they have some type of need, like a humerus fracture that they have to go into surgery for, then they're going to have to get that um, extra imaging so that the orthopedic surgeons can take care of them. Um, for any shoulder injuries, do you most likely use an ultrasound first, then an x-ray? Yes. Typically, if you are skilled as a physician in the point of care ultrasound, usually you want to get the ultrasound. The x-ray is really just to rule out the fracture or any other type of trauma for the most part. Or you can still diagnose with x-ray. So if you don't know point of care ultrasound, so I'm not, I'm not certified in point of care ultrasound. I'm not an emergency room doctor because most of the time emergency room doctors are going to be seeing this type of patient, the shoulder dislocation. That's most of the time. Or, I mean, I was a medic out in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico. And we did see a lot of shoulder injuries because the falls or people were diving from the cliffs. And so then they would um, get a shoulder dislocation. But otherwise, it's mostly acute care or urgent care providers, ER doctors that are going to see this. So, um, so yeah, ultrasound is typically recommended for those who do have that certification and who do have that training. And then x-ray. Good Good question, Fatima. And then neurovascular compromise, what I mean by that, and we'll get into this as well, is more um, usually the axillary nerve damage or 
um, axillary artery damage. So some type of vessel damage or some type of nerve damage. And so typically with this shoulder dislocation, and we'll get into this, the um, axillary nerve or the axillary artery is going to be damaged. So you're going to have loss of feeling. You're going to have paresthesias. You could have loss of pulses, poor cap refill. You could have pallor. The upper extremity is cold. Um, and you can also have loss of sensation to that posterior part of the deltoid because of that axillary nerve damage. So with shoulder dislocations, um, yes, it can be a loss of blood flow. That is, is very dangerous, the loss of blood flow um, because of the axillary artery just opens up and it's just pouring blood into this compartment or this compartment. And then um, it, gets, it can actually cause also compartment syndrome, which blocks off um, the blood flow as well. So shoulder dislocations, um, it is a very superficial a um, joint. Um, and so it accounts for most of the major joint dislocations. The anterior shoulder dislocation is most common, and I'll show you in the case as well what that looks like. But the common cause is either it's a blow to the shoulder when it's like abducted and externally rotated. So um, externally rotated. So this is medially rotated. This is externally rotated. And then extended arm is when the arm is back. So usually, so you're like falling like this. So that's what happens with an anterior shoulder dislocation or like she was on the boat, she could have had her arm like this and then it could have just been um, separated. So, um, so that's the most common cause. So anterior shoulder dislocation accounts for majority of them. This is mostly what you're going to see. Um, and usually the arm, so if you saw our patient, she had her arm like out like this and it was a little bit externally rotated and that was her position of comfort. So that's how you're going to see them. Um, the chromium appears very prominent. And so, and again, just as we talked about that neurovascular compromise, 40% of the time it is associated with that axillary nerve damage. But when you usually reduce it, the axillary nerve damage goes away. So you can heal that nerve if you can get that reduced, you know, sooner than later. So that nerve doesn't get damaged permanently. And then the labral tears of that, um, shoulder joint can happen, the fracture can happen in any of the areas, but especially if that humeral head is a very common picture. So let's go back and let's look at um, that patient and look at her acromion. Oh, hold on. Okay, there we go. Oops. I don't think it's, oh, it is. Okay, good. Can you guys see the screen? Okay, great. Thanks, guys. All right. So let's look back at her arm. So let's see. The other person's boat, a big wave came and separated the two vessels. And I kind of, and it kind of took my left arm with it. And next thing I knew, I heard three pops and I couldn't lift up my left arm. Okay. And your left arm here, that's that's where it's hurting. We'll compare yep. this. The right arm is fine, right? You can move that yes, around. This arm's fine. Right. Yep. Yeah, okay. This one here. See, there's a little cornice freak. So you can kind of see before we put, oh, let me look right here. Okay, so um, you can kind of see her little shoulder bump right there. So basically her chromion is sticking out. And so this is what happens because the humerus is not in the shoulder joint anymore. So it's kind of hanging down right here. So, um, so let's talk now about um, the outcomes. And so what they're going to do in this case is, which there's multiple ways to treat a shoulder dislocation. So usually we do it via sedation. That's very typical in the emergency room. Um, and this, there's a couple new techniques. Instead of doing sedation, they are doing some nerve blocks. So there's a couple different ways to do it. There's a supraclavicular nerve block, and then there's an interscalene nerve block. And so I'll show you that what the scalenes are. So the scalenes are two muscles, and the brachial plexus runs through those muscles, um, basically right through here. And so when you block that, you can block this entire area. So she won't feel much when they do reduce it. Okay, so um, this is actually what the dislocated shoulder looks like on ultrasound, and it's very quick, so I'm going to pause it. Okay, 
So if you look here, here is basically the um, spine of the scapula. And so, and then here's the kind of round edge of that humeral head. And so, oops. And so really it needs to be that humeral head is usually abutting right here. So it's much closer here. And so it's separated. So you can see it, it's clunked down. So that's how they figured out that, yes, on ultrasound, this patient does have an anterior shoulder dislocation. Um, and so they just show you down here, there's that space between the humerus and the acromion. They are going to use um, lidocaine injection. Um, it depends on how long you think you're going to be able to reduce this. So they think it's only going to take several minutes to reduce this. Otherwise, if it was going to take several hours. You'd want to add another numbing medicine that lasts for several hours like bupivacaine. And so um, this gets more advanced into the point of care ultrasound, but they're actually going to show you what they're doing here. So here's the needle coming and here's this brachial plexus right in this area. So here's on the middle scalene, here's over here is the anterior scalene. And so in between that is this brachial plexus. And so they're trying to go um, down there. Now it comes with risk because that phrenic nerve is there. So if you hit that phrenic nerve, um, it's very difficult to breathe because it's gonna stop that diaphragm, one side of the diaphragm. Um, and so, um, so yeah, you kind of have to be pretty good with the ultrasound to do it. Um, and so I think this is the block that they show you. Can you hit a choir? So lidocaine burns if you don't buffer it. Um, and so it's not the most pleasant medications, but then it gets numb after a few seconds. They usually can buffer it depending upon what type of lidocaine it is. But yeah, lidocaine definitely burns quite a bit. Um, let's see. I think this is just showing um, the injection again. Okay, yeah, so not much to see there based on what we've already seen. You look at this here. Again, they're just showing you that needle. So that needle's coming through here and it's um, going into this plexus. See that needle, hold on. Kind of have to do this a few times. See this needle coming in. So this is exactly what he was doing. And then he gets to inject it right into that plexus where all these nerves are. One more time. Okay, so um, again, they're just showing a little still picture. Um, here's the needle and trying to get into this nerve bundle here. Okay, so let's go over a couple other um, issues with the shoulder dislocation, and then let's go into the treatment. Okay, so there's a couple other shoulder dislocations and, um, but they're a little bit more rare. So posterior shoulder dislocation, this is more two to 4%. And on physical exam, the arm is more abducted and internally rotated. So it's kind of in that sling position. So that's what they'll present with. So it'll be more like this. So adduction is where you're adding it to the body. And then internal rotation is where it's kind of like medially rotated. This is caused by a blow to this side of the shoulder. So obviously if it's going to get the, the arm, the humerus is going to go back that way. So it's more like a blow to this. So it pushes the shoulder that pushes the arm that way. Um, and especially when it's adducted. So shoulder. So it's typically this in order for it to go a little bit back that way. Um, this one, oops, sorry, is associated more with um, a higher risk of humeral head, neck, and tears of the labrum and the rotator cuff. So definitely getting an x-ray, probably getting an MRI at some point in time after um, this is uh, reduced. The anterior shoulder location is much less in terms of incidence, um, and this is caused by hyper 
abduction with an axial loading of an abducted arm. So, so hyper abduction. So again, abduction, and this is adduction. So axial loading of an abducted arm is usually, um, so axial load is just kind of like, like this. So would be a big blow to, to the arm like this. This is highly associated with axillary nerve and artery injury. So definitely probably going to be getting extra imaging after you do the ultrasound, the x-ray, um, and then potentially either a CT or MRI, depending upon the patient's um, clinical presentation. So she said, our patient said as on the clinical presentation, she had three pops. And so that is very typical. Anybody who has a shoulder dislocation usually can hear that popping sound or that feel that sensation of a pop. And then all of a sudden they have pain and, and really can't move their arm. Um, and again, so um, the people with the anterior shoulder dislocation, it's going to be abducted and externally rotated. Um, posterior, they're going to kind of have it more like in the sling position. So you didn't see the neurovascular examination. This is, um, I think this got a little bit blurry, but here is this um, axillary artery. So it's a pretty big artery that um, comes, comes down with that brachial plexus. So the brachial plexus comes down with that axillary artery, and then it also wraps around that humerus. So it's highly likely it could just shear um, and, and have a big, you know, vessel injury. And so um, axillary nerve also comes off this brachial plexus and wraps around the humerus as well. So you can see how a shoulder dislocation or a fracture can really rip that. And that's why, um, it's very high, 40%. So what happens when you have that axillary nerve injury? So it really provides um, sensation to um, that deltoid, especially kind of the lateral or the posterior part of the deltoid. And then it also helps you abduct the arm. So it's motor to the deltoid and the teres minor. So kind of externally rotate and then abduct as well. Um, and then, so treatment, uh, which we're going to get into, um, I'm going to show you guys as soon as I answer, what's the procedure if the person injecting the needle accidentally injects at or near the phrenic nerve? So symptomatic until, so that's why lidocaine, so that's why they love to use just lidocaine because it only lasts several minutes. So once that lidocaine wears off, hopefully that phrenic nerve comes to life as long as they didn't like inject it straight into that phrenic nerve, which is very rare, um, especially if ultrasound, you typically wouldn't, but lidocaine can spread all around. So you're diffusing a whole bunch of liquid into this area. And so that can diffuse into all those different fascia and all the different tissues. And so you could highly likely, you know, numb that phrenic nerve. And when you numb that phrenic nerve, then you have different difficulty breathing, if you have enough difficulty breathing where it's going to cause respiratory distress, they could probably just bag or they could give oxygen. It just depends on the patient's case, but they're probably going to treat them symptomatically until that lidocaine wears off. So, and then Tesfia, um, what happens if the axillary nerve gets damaged? So if the axillary nerve gets damaged, it, well, actually it typically does. So 40% of the time it does get damaged in the shoulder dislocations. Um, but when you reduce it, it usually goes away. Now, sometimes there's long-term damage. And so then if there is axillary nerve damage, it is pretty prevalent there. Typically they'll refer to the orthopedic surgeon before they do any shoulder reduction so that they don't damage it anymore. And then what they'll do is they'll typically go to rehab and physical therapy to get those nerves, um, to work again. Most of the time you can, um, people get acupuncture, people get physical therapy, do rehab, um, and then they can get their nerve, um, to function again. Some people don't, but it's a very rare, um, um, condition. Okay. I think I answered all those. Okay. All right, so let's look at the reduction because they don't show you how to reduce it. And you guys would absolutely want to know this because um, this happens so commonly, just like if you're playing sports, if you guys are out on vacation and someone falls, um, you guys can be the hero and reduce it on your own. You don't, uh, like three force of the time, you don't need sedation or medication to reduce it. Um, you just have to have the skills to do it. Okay, so let's look. The best video I found was through the BC Emergency uh, Medicine Network. And so um, 
it's about 15 minutes. He shows you several different techniques, but the most common one, I think the most research one, he does a different one, but the most research one was the scapular manipulation. And that works about 80 to hundred percent of the time. I think he shows that at the very end, he does describe everything at the very end. He goes through a lot very quickly in the beginning, but then he describes each method at the very end. The reason very gentle traction helps to alleviate pain and helps them to relax is that it removes the painful pressure of the humeral head held by muscle spasm against the inferior glenoid rim. This x-ray belongs to the patient in the following video, which demonstrates initiation of patient positioning and relaxation techniques. The patient was really keen not to receive any medication. He relaxed very well and tolerated a trial of several painless gentle reduction maneuvers that didn't end up working. Very gentle track, it should feel better. Really gentle. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. You just let your muscles go. It's kind of pretend you're just lying in a warm water bed. Just let your body go. We're gonna lie in back a little bit. I'm just gonna lay you back a little bit. Get up there, we go. Yeah, exactly. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to feel better. You know, just relax it. Okay. Just let your whole body relax. Go into your nose and out through your mouth. And I've got your shoulder, so you just let it go. Just really let your shoulder go. Let your whole body relax. Just let it go. Good. Now, every time you breathe out, let your shoulder go. Just physically let it go. Into your nose, out through your mouth, nice big breaths. Really let it go. Into your nose, out through your mouth. We got an x ray to rule out significant uh, unpredicted fractures. The x ray confirmed simple anterior dislocation, which was then easily reduced using some procedural sedation. In my clinical experience with over 1,000 shoulder reductions over the years, I use analgesia and or sedation about 25% of the time for run, one reason or another, which means that roughly three out of sh four shoulders go back in easily and painlessly without analgesia or sedation. Traction countertraction is often described as overcoming the muscle spasm when in fact, large forces are not required. It should be gentle. So the traction is where he's pulling on the arm. The counter traction is using that sheet to provide some gentle counter traction. Sit, relax. Okay. It's important that you just relax your shoulder back down against the bed. Yeah. Yeah. Get find that it's too clamsy on your cock. Yeah. There we go. If they don't reduce with simple yeah. traction, relax. you can continue with forward elevation. If they don't reduce during forward elevation, you can continue to spasso positioning with mild traction vertically or use FAIR's fast, reliable, and safe method. With both techniques, external rotation of the humeral head presents more articular smooth cartilage to the glenoid rim and unhooks the hill sacs compression injury, allowing it to slide more easily over the rim and into the socket. External rotation should be performed gently and slowly so as not to induce muscle spasm. You got it? If external rotation doesn't work, you can easily progress to forward elevation, the full extent of which wasn't even required in this next case. It's pretty externally rotated, you know. Yeah. Often, often, if they're going to go in, they go in by now. Yeah, so, so his main is different yeah. technique. Yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah. Maintain your traction. So you don't don't remove that. Oh, and then that's it. Yes. You may have to. You might have up. to stand. Yeah, there. there, you went in. You went in. Okay. Relax now. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And then so. Yeah, you did. Yeah, sounds great. Much better. Yeah. So. 
That's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. The following video shows Emma, who is a nurse in our emergency department, trying out some massage and then external rotation on a patient who presented with a dislocated shoulder. Just an hour earlier, Emma had helped me video the final clip in this presentation, which demonstrates how to move fluidly between the different yeah, techniques. Got it now for you. Awesome. This was a great opportunity for Emma to try a couple of techniques she'd never tried before. And the next thing that you're going to do is you lay, lay him back a little bit here. And then we're going to maintain the traction with your right hand and then start to do very gradual. Yeah, that's good. In through your nose, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Gently, you're relaxing, okay? In through your nose, out through your mouth. Every time you blow out, let your shoulder go completely. There you go. Good job. Good job. Now your left hand is going to his wrist and very gentle, slow external rotation, Easy. maintaining the traction with your right hand. You know, very, very slowly, very, very slowly. In through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. And let your shoulder go. It's going to go. Perfect. Relax, relax. Yep. Relax. That actually didn't hurt. You did really, really yeah. well. <laughs> awesome. Now just check, just, just check for a little bit of internal external rotation. What may be on? Yeah, just, just very gentle back and forth to make sure that he's in. Yeah. And he is, right? That's all you've got to do. It's great. Oh. Awesome. Thank you. Nice job. With the Milch technique, it often takes five to 10 minutes to get painlessly into the fully abducted, externally rotated position. This recreates the position of injury usually and exposes the human. So just letting you know for this one, so all of these that he's showing, he's not doing any sedation on, he hasn't done any nerve blocks on. So um, he's doing just deep breathing, calming them down, making sure they're not tensing. There's, when you have that shoulder dislocation, you're having a ton of muscle spasms. And so you just have to be very, very gentle, very, very careful, slow traction, getting them into that position. So they're going to have to slowly pull it, slowly externally rotate in terms of some of the ones that he's presented. This case, they're doing acupressure on the ear. The ear actually has some pretty good pain control. And just at that antitragus and tragus, it actually represent many of the areas of the brain and some of those pain pathways. Ways. And so just by applying pressure, poking them with needles like I do, can um, provide pain control. Humeral head to the bank art tear, which allows it to slide back into the socket. Sometimes a gentle push on the humeral head helps, the so-called gentle pulsion maneuver. There is usually no clunk, and it is often imperceptible, and perhaps only detected by a sense by the patient that something has changed. So you then must gently check position by maintaining traction and, main, and bringing the arm back down to the side. This scientist from uh, Russia in his 70s was bound and determined to avoid medication, referring to have his daughter, who was an internist, apply acupressure to his earlobes. And he went through all the reduction maneuvers up to and including Milch and finally had success with the Milch technique. And it took about nine minutes to reduce his shoulder. He was very proud. So let it go now. Oh no, you just let it go. It slid in. Oh. Yeah, see, it slid in. That's milk, milch. Yeah. Just relax now. I'm just going to mm -hmm. test you. Okay, rotation. Oh, you did it. Yeah. Good job. Nice job. Good. Scapular manipulation is very useful when the patient presents in the middle of the night, slightly drunk, usually with their arm hanging down in front of them like an elephant's trunk. In the following video, I am using scapular manipulation first on the right and then the left in two different patients. Neither patient was inebriated, and in the first video, it's a paramedic who was actually helping me with the maneuver. Simply lead them over to a bed, lie them down, pump up the bed high, show their buddy how to apply gentle traction with supination, and then you rotate the scapula down towards the humeral head, clockwise on the right, counterclockwise on the left. It helps if you can get your thumb underneath the inferior angle. 
of the scapula. And relax. Ooh. Relax. Just relax, just relax, just relax. My method consists of doing whatever seems best for the patient and not being limited by only knowing a couple of techniques. This will depend on how they present. You can start with scapular manipulation if they present in a position where lying prone is easiest. And if they present sitting, you can start with gentle traction and perhaps some massage as described by Cunningham. Progress if necessary to external rotation, then forward elevation, spatial positioning, or try the fast and reliable technique. And then if their shoulder still hasn't reduced, move to milch positioning, maintaining very gentle traction throughout all maneuvers so as not to induce pain and resultant muscle spasm. If procedural sedation is necessary or desired, ensure adequate procedural sedation so you don't have to exert large forces or pull hard as this predisposes to the chances of traction axillary nerve injury. The following video demonstrates progressing seamlessly from one technique to the next in a volunteer without a dislocated shoulder. Keep in mind the flow in this video will, for demonstration purposes, progress more quickly than in a real patient because you need to go slowly and gently so that you are less likely to cause pain or muscle spasm. At the end, I will demonstrate how you might apply sheets to the patient and yourself to facilitate reduction under procedural sedation for posterior dislocations or those anterior dislocations that you are unable to reduce by the other methods. Okay, and so to demonstrate on someone that doesn't have a dislocated shoulder, uh, how to flow between techniques, I'm gonna be doing this fairly quickly, not taking the usual amount of time. I would, I'm not wearing a mask, just so that you'll be able to hear me. So patient presents with uh, an anterior dislocation from the clean, and I've performed my history and physical and they have agreed to try uh, to have it reduced without any analgesia. So you can start off to gain the patient's trust and to relieve pain simply by trying to apply a little bit of traction. Um, not a lot, just a little bit. And what that does is it helps to unhinge the humeral head from the inferior glenoid rim. That should start to feel a little bit better. And then you can actually take their, their arm and while you're talking to them, just saying things like, okay, let me have your shoulder, relax, work in your breathing, in through your nose, out through your mouth. You can try if you want to, a little bit of gentle massage as described in the Cunningham technique of the trapezius coming down into the bicep. The important thing is once you've uh, initiated your traction, don't let go or change it. Otherwise, it'll cause pain and result in muscle spasm. So they may... What we do for kids is often clinical hypnosis. So we do a lot for those of us certified, especially in the pain field, um, do quite a bit of hypnosis for kids so that they don't have to undergo um, scary needles or scary procedures. Um, and they are really good at it. So they can get into um, a lot of pain reduction just using the power of their imagination. They reduce right there. If they don't, you can very easily go into maintaining your traction, very simple external rotation. Again, telling the patient to uh, concentrate on their breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, relax, and make the movement very, very slow. If external rotation doesn't work, you can continue on into forward elevation and bring them down and maintain the traction. And at this point, you can either decide to or not put a sheet. So he's going to go through all the methods right now. So he hasn't been able to reduce it, but he's going to go through it all. So you guys can learn all the methods for yourself. So you can try this at home. Underneath them. If you're doing very gentle traction, you shouldn't have to put a sheet. For the purposes of illustration, we'll put one just to show you how you would do it if you chose to do it. So again, I'm maintaining the traction, putting a sheet there, but I'm not going to be pulling hard. So here's simple traction. Now, when I do this, I supinate the forearm so that I externally rotate the humeral head, which presents more articular surface to the glenoid rim. So it slides in and over. If it doesn't go in with very simple traction, I can then do forward elevation. Sometimes what I'll do is just lie them down a little bit, get them in a position where it's easier 
to do the forward elevation. Again, maintaining consistent gentle traction. Then if it hasn't reduced, you can uh, proceed. Sometimes it's easier to, to cross over and take them this way and do forward elevation. And as we do forward elevation, it often goes in right about there. If it doesn't, you can continue right up into the spasso position and continue with traction in spasso position. If it doesn't go in, you can continue, come back down, again, maintaining that same uh, degree of traction. I like to hold their hand because that uh, just helps them to relax. And you can try the so-called fast, easy, reliable method or Ferris technique, where you just very simply oscillate 10 degrees or so as you come up into abduction. If it still doesn't go in, you can simply maintain your traction and by taking them at the elbow, bring them up into uh, preparation for the modified Milch maneuver. So now we have them at 90 degrees of abduction. And now we're gonna very, very slowly and gradually take them into 90 degrees of external rotation. And again, I'm going faster than you would. You don't wanna cause pain and muscle spasm. And sometimes I'll change hands here maintain the traction, never move the shoulder once you've started, continue the external rotation. If it doesn't go in, you can try the so-called gentle pulsion maneuver of the humeral head, just giving it a little bit of a push over the glenoid rim. If it's gonna go in here, there won't be a clunk. The patient may just say, hmm, something feels different. And then you can't really tell because it's anatomically different. You won't see uh, the sulcus sign uh, as well. So then you have to check to see if it's in, and then by maintaining your traction, so you don't hurt them, if it isn't in, then maintain your traction, bring them back down, and then you'll be able to see if it slid back in or not. If it hasn't slid in at this uh, point, then uh, you can decide if you want to try the, the prone position, the scapular manipulation uh, position. Or you may decide if this is too difficult, uh, I'm going to get an x-ray, do some sedation. And then I'll just point out the three-sheet technique for uh, relocating uh, either a difficult anterior shoulder dislocation or a posterior shoulder dislocation. So they've been off to x-ray, they've come back, they're procedurally sedated. And now with the three-sheet technique, what we do is we already have our sheet in, in uh, position for this. My sheet, I'm going to get my assistant to come around and tie on me as I get ready. So the patient's sedated now, so you don't have to worry too much about pain. But that, so yeah, you so you're going to wrap it around me here and then tie it up behind my back. Low down in your hips so that yes. once that's tied, then you, you and your assistant can just provide gentle traction counter traction. The beauty of this is that now I can control external internal rotation very easily while I'm applying as much traction as I want to do. And in the case of uh, sometimes, well, usually anterior dislocation and sometimes posterior dislocation, a little bit of external rotation will unhook them and they'll go back in. This is how posterior dislocations are described. In my experience, what I found is that in fact, there's often a reverse Bill Sachs lesion and you have to actually internally rotate them slightly, and then they'll slide in. If they don't slide in like this, then you get another uh, assistant, and this can be a, a physician colleague or someone else, to come around and apply a sheet from the side, nice and wide, and then as you're providing very uh, gentle traction counter traction, making sure they're adequately sedated so you don't have to traction hard, you just exert a little lateral pull as well, and that slides the humeral head over and into the socket. And that's it. Yep. All right. So I just have one last poll for you all. Um, as we've learned all the cool techniques, especially without sedation, um, what do you need to make sure that the patient does not have before you reduce the shoulder dislocation that you can have multiple answers, I think, to this? 
And then after this, I've just got um, a couple more slides and then we're done. So any questions, just let me know. Oh yeah, you guys are so smart. Okay, perfect. Okay, so yes, pretty much all right. Um, let's go over that. Okay. So yes, so what you want to avoid is definitely an axillary nerve injury. You want to avoid an arterial injury. You want to avoid doing it for a fracture of a humeral neck because that could lead to avascular necrosis. Um, and then there is one thing that we didn't talk about, but um, what very rarely, but especially in the elderly because of the fragility, they can actually get their humerus dislodged in their ribs. And so it's an intrathoracic dislocation um, or it can get dislodged underneath the clavicle. Um, and so this um, is pretty significant. So you always want to refer to orthopedic surgery before you do any um, shoulder reduction. And then all you have to do is just once you reduce the shoulder, put the patient in the sling, um, make sure you do their neurovascular exam after reduction, so before and after, just to make sure that axillary nerve, if it did have any damage before, it doesn't now. Um, get any post-reduction imaging, make sure that humerus is back in that glenohumeral area. Um, and then usually you do want to do follow-up with the orthopedic surgeon because there can be that rotator cuff issues or injuries. You can have those labral tears. And so some of these people likely will need physical therapy um, after their shoulder dislocation. So um, what if the all the moves don't work and what does the doctor do? Well, so he was very, very gentle in most of his maneuvers, um, even though he did it very fast at the, at the end. Um, oftentimes, why we do sedation is just so we can do it um, a little bit, we can do it a little bit more forcefully. Um, and so it typically works with sedation. If it doesn't, then um, we just get orthopedic surgery referral on board and, and have them take a look at it. So great question. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? And then I'm also going to um, put that webinar 300 for you guys who are interested in our certification programs and our mentorship programs. Webinar 300. And then make sure to check out our website at um, advclinical.org. Hold on, let me put this in here. Um, so you can check out all our programs and it was so great to be here with you. Yes, I think they did record it. Um, so I think it will be somewhere to watch. Um, good question. Um, and if there is vas neurovascular damage, what step would you take for treatment? So um, Linda, this is where we actually have to typically refer to orthopedic surgery. Sometimes we have to refer to vascular surgery, especially if there is an arterial artery damage. We do have to be um, pretty quick uh, with those urgent referrals because there can be some significant damage, especially with um, the compartment syndrome, if like the blood gets stuck in the fascia and it causes um, ischemia, um, which is decreased blood flow and causes kind of tissue necrosis um, after the neurovascular damage. Um, and then obviously PT um, for the most part and pain control if there is nerve damage. Um, we, yes, you get a certificate. I think it should be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. You get one hour of a virtual shadowing certificate, Isabella. And then um, Purity, you have a question. Yes, it's the certification programs. Um, so medical assistant, um, research assistant, those types of certifications, and then also the mentorship program. So if you're considering um, medical school, dental school, um, PA school, pharmacy school, then you can use that webinar 300. So, and there, yes, there will be more sessions like this, um, Fatima. Um, we love putting on the webinars. So look out for your email when we have more. I hope to see you again. Um, oh, that's awesome. Oh, great, Catherine. I'm glad you passed your medical assistant exam. Okay, let us know um, what you're up to next time we see you. Uh, you are so welcome, Arizo. And then the... 
Um, mentorship, we have a question about how long are the mentorships? It is one year, so 12 months. You guys are so welcome. Have a great weekend. I hope this springtime is so much better for you than the winter. Um, let's see, is the mentorship program? Yes, you. there is a mentorship program available. So I am one of the, I'm the MD advisor and the pre-med mentor for getting into medical school. Um, yeah, you guys are all welcome. It was so great to be here. Okay, look out for your emails and uh, you'll get that one hour virtual shadowing certificate. And then um, otherwise I'll see you hopefully at next webinar. You guys all take care. All right, everyone. Bye.